In a period of just five days in a row, a total of nine people sent me links to a video posted by a YouTube user called SG Collins. No relation to Michael Collins, I think. The film was posted on December 3rd, 2012, and, at first, went almost unnoticed. Then on around January the 17th, it received a mysterious boost that propelled its popularity to over half a million views within a few days. It turns out the film had been posted on God only knows how many popular blogs. Not just pro-NASA and astronomy related blogs, but also a large number of miscellaneous blogs and, ahem, skeptic blogs. It even found its way into the Washington Post. Don't print anything these days. In this video, Collins rambles for about five minutes, claiming that he is unsure that men went to the moon, but is sure that they did not have the technology to fake it. Yeah, try wrap your head around that logic. Before getting to the good stuff, he also spends his time propagating the usual pro-NASA claims that I've debunked countless times, and he makes a number of ad hominem attacks on conspiracy theorists born after the Apollo days. I should also point out that Collins claims to have been involved in the film business for three decades. Uh, I've been shooting in the studio for about 30 years now. I know what to look for. So, you've been in the film business since 1982. Hmm, that's a good 10 years after the Apollo program ended, but still, that's impressive. Let's see why you think it is impossible to fake Apollo. The pivotal claim for the Apollo hoax theory, without which it all falls apart, is that what we saw on TV was slow motion footage of astronauts running around in a film studio. Because if it wasn't slow motion, it couldn't have happened on Earth, right? Let's talk about how slow motion works in film and video. There are two ways to make motion slow. One is you shoot it at normal speed and play it back slow. The other is you shoot it fast and play it back normal. The second way is called overcranking. It looks smoother and more realistic because you're sampling natural motion at a higher frame rate. But that means we would have had to shoot it on film using high-speed film cameras, right? Why? Uh, because in 1969 there were no high-speed video cameras yet. The electronics just weren't there. No high-speed video cameras in 1969? Wow! I wonder how much research Collins did on that. With a simple Google search on high-speed video 1960s, I pulled up this motionvideoproducts.com page, a website run by professional experts in high-speed photography. And on that page, we find this short, sweet, and to-the-point statement. Up to the early 1960s, film was the only medium available to record motion that was too fast for observation. In the late 1960s, the development of reliable video technology gave researchers and engineers another tool for motion analysis and the benefit of immediate review of the recorded event. Thirty years in the film business, you say? Perhaps Collins is thinking of high-speed video cameras with charge-couple devices, or CCD chips, which didn't come out until 1982. The CCD chip is a device that converts the optical image into an electronic signal, which is then stored onto videotape. This differs from film cameras, in which the image is transferred directly onto film frames. The CCD chip revolutionized the high-speed video camera's role in the film industry. Pre-1982 high-speed video cameras used a video tube, like a Videocon tube or a Farnsworth image dissector instead of a CCD chip. And as since such cameras evidently were available during the Apollo days, any claims about not having the technology to fake the moonwalk videos are moot. Now for faking the Apollo 12 through to 17 moonwalks with high-speed video cameras, I'd recommend using the Farnsworth image dissector. Wikipedia's entry on high-speed photography explains that early high-speed video cameras with videocon tubes suffered from a ghosting effect that was not solved until 1979, whereas their Farnsworth image dissector counterparts didn't. Of course, Apollo 11 was notorious for its ghostly images, and so high-speed cameras with the inferior videocon tube would have been perfect. The Wikipedia article also says that the fastest these pre-1982 cameras could record was 60 frames per second. That's just fine. The Apollo's 12 to 17 telecasts were broadcast at 30 frames per second. Originally it was thought that the Apollo footage was slowed down to 50%. But in 2008, I learned the hard way that it was actually 67%. Let's look at both scenarios. If 30 frames per second playback is 50% normal speed, 60 frames per second would be perfect. 
If the playback was 67%, we'd only need to shoot it to 45 frames per second. The Apollo 11 telecasts were only 10 frames per second, and thus we'd only need to shoot less than the normal format of 30 frames per second. That being said, there is little point in continuing with the rest of Collins's video. But being a completist, I will. Some people did have a magnetic disc recorder that could capture normal speed video and play it back slow. They used it for sports replays. It could record up to 30 seconds. Play back at uh, 10 FPS and you've got a whopping 90 seconds of slow-mo. So if we're faking this with electronic slow-mo at one-third speed, we only need to record about 47 minutes of continuous live-action video. Well, that's a lot more than that Ampex disc recorder could hold. But NASA is special. Maybe they have a big disc recorder, right, in 1969. Okay, how much bigger? 95 times bigger? I don't know, man. I mean, government agencies are powerful, but they're not God. Okay, now Collins is just talking utter gibberish. There would be no need to invent a supersized magnetic disc recorder because ultimately the finished film would not be stored on that disc recorder. It is true that the disc recorder could only record and store 30 seconds of footage, but it was also possible to feed recordings from normal videotape into it. In a 1967 Ampex press release, we find this statement. The HS100 is the first Ampex video disc system offered for independent use. Although the disc recording technique is also employed in the Ampex document filing and retrieval system. In a section on Ampex's website, we are told this little bit of information about their video file information system, from which their HS100 disc recorder was derived. This system retrieved a document images stored on videotape and duplicated them on disc recorder workstations so office personnel could view the documents in instant replay stop action format. In other words, Scans of documents were originally recorded onto regular videotape. 30 seconds worth of videotape recordings were then fed into the magnetic disc recorder and then played back to be viewed. There is no reason why motion videos stored on tape could not also be duplicated on a disc recorder. In fact, in April 1968, Ampex unveiled an even larger disc recorder, the HS200 Teleproduction System. According to this flyer, not only could you copy videotape recordings onto the disc recorder, you could even pre-mark the frames you wanted so the machine would only capture those. Returning to the Ampex press release, we find that The HS100 may also be used effectively for rapid low-cost production of color commercials and special effects materials. Okay, so if we are using magnetic disc recorders to fake the moon landings, all we would need do is film the whole thing on videotape at normal speed, feed that videotape into the disc recorder 30 seconds at a time, and then record that disc recorder's playback on a second videotape. Eventually, you will have the entire EVA converted into slow motion and stored onto videotape. Actually, upon further reading, I learned that the HS200 lets you handle material of any length, from short commercials to complete programs. Very interesting! Well, if it can hold material of any length, that one HS200 could easily store the entire lunar EVA. Although, I also read elsewhere that the HS200 only had 30 minutes of storage. But in either case, using this machine would clearly make the conversion process much simpler. And considering that the HS200 was only about the size of a small piano, I wouldn't exactly call that 95 times bigger than the HS100. Now that you have your moonwalk video converted into slow motion, all you gotta do now is have the lads at the Manned Spaceflight Network relay it to Houston and the press as though it were actually coming from space, or, assuming the Misfin aren't part of the conspiracy, transmit this video recording to an unmanned spacecraft landed on the moon, which will then relay it back to Earth. Then again, they are NASA. Maybe they did have some special way to overcrank video uh, in 1969 for an hour and a half. Maybe they had some top-secret high-speed electronics that the rest of the world never knew about. Oh, wait a minute. No, you guys said that uh, their navigation computers were too slow. <clears throat> I guess we can't have it both ways. I mean, it can't be fast and slow at the same time, right? This is a red herring fallacy. The computer that NASA used on the Apollo spacecraft has nothing to do with the computing power of high-speed video cameras of the day or any computer that NASA used on the ground for that matter. 
And since they had high-speed video cameras during that time, NASA wouldn't need some super-advanced top-secret technology to pull this off. Collins then goes on to discuss using high-speed film cameras to record the EVA, and then converting those recordings to video. To my knowledge, no conspiracy theorist has ever claimed that the Apollo telecasts were shot on film. But, we'll ignore for a moment that there were indeed high-speed video cameras in the 60s, and even if there weren't, you'd still be able to run hours of videotape recordings through a magnetic disc recorder 30 seconds at a time. We'll forget about that for a moment, and follow Collins down his film-to-video road. Wouldn't it be easier to shoot this on film? I mean, in 1969, we already knew how to overcrank film. Um, for Apollo 11, we only need to shoot 30 FPS and play it back at 10. Okay, let's try that. I'd recommend you shoot on 35 millimeter to minimize the film grain. That's what Kubrick would have done. Now let's see, normal 35 millimeter runs at 90 feet per minute, but since we're shooting at 30 FPS, it'll be 112 and a half feet per minute. We need uh, 47 minutes of original film, so that's about 5,300 feet. And of course, there's no such thing as a film magazine that big. Volkswagen? But if you shoot 1,000 foot loads, that's about that big, then you can do it in five mags. First of all, five 1,000 foot magazines to shoot a reel 5,300 feet long? Seriously? And they say I'm no good at math. And second of all, throughout his video, Collins continuously discusses slowing the videos down to only one third. No conspiracy theorist has, to my knowledge, ever proposed slowing it down by that much. As stated previously, originally it was thought the footage was slowed down by 50%, but now it has been established that it was slowed down by 33%. Now the Apollo 11 EVA was recorded at 10 frames per second, and then filmed off a screen by TV cameras running at 30 frames per second. Or at least that's what we're told. Looking more closely at the available 30 frames per second footage, however, I am led to believe that the frame rate shown is more likely 24 frames per second, because at 10 frames per second, the motion would look very jumpy. And converting 10 frames per second to 30 frames per second would mean the resulting video would only update itself once every 3 frames on average. Instead, the motion we see is fairly smooth. And the frames appear to update at least 4 out of every 5 frames in the 30 frame per second video. The only way to get such a frequent updating of frames would be to speed up the frame rate. But in the case of a 10 frame per second video, doing so would make the motion look ridiculously too fast, which is clearly not the case in the Apollo 11 telecast. This leads me to believe that the actual playback rate was 24 frames per second, rather than 10, which would mean the original film rate would need to be one and a half times higher, at 36 frames per second. But, putting that interesting discovery aside for another day, let's just assume it was played at 10 frames per second. As Collins pointed out in his video, the EVA footage lasted for 143 minutes. So let's find out just how much film we need. We all consider three different scenarios. First, where they shoot at 10 frames per second and play back at normal speed. Second, where they slow it down to 67%. And third, where they slow it to 50%. In our first scenario, at 10 frames per second, for 143 minutes, that works out to be 85,800 frames in total. One foot of 35mm film holds 16 frames. Dividing that into the total number of frames gives us 5,362.5 feet of film. So this is what we require for playback at normal speed. Now in the second scenario, we slow it down by a factor of 1.5, which is 67% normal speed. That's going to require a frame rate of 15 frames per second. But, since we're going to be playing this back in slow motion, we won't need 143 minutes of original footage. We only need two-thirds of that, or 95 and a third minutes of actual footage. That gives us 15 by 60 by 95 and a third, which is 85,800 frames in total. Dividing that by the number of frames per foot gives us 5,362.5 feet of film. Hmm, that's the same requirement we got for 10 frames per second. Next, in our third scenario, we slow it down by a factor of 2 to 50%. That's going to require a frame rate of 20 frames per second. But since we're playing it back at half speed, we won't need 143 minutes of original footage. We only need half of that, or 71.5 minutes of actual film time. 
This gives us 20 by 60 by 71.5, which is 85,800 frames. Dividing that by the number of frames per foot gives us 5,362.5 feet of film. Once again, the same result as before. In fact, it turns out that no matter how high we set the frame rate, the film requirements will remain the same. That's because each time we double the frame rate, we also halve the recording time. So regardless of the frame rate, to record this on 35mm film will require a total of six 1000 foot magazines. Six magazines. But Collins reckons we're only allowed one single magazine. Um, oh dear. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? If I may offer a better idea, why not shoot it on 16mm film instead? After all, NASA had been using it since the Mercury days, and it was the standard film used in television. And as far as film grain goes, I have always found the 16mm reels to have remarkably superb picture quality. In fact, I think it looks better than the telecasts. And did I mention that one foot of 16mm film contains a whopping 40 frames? Now shooting at 20 frames per second on 16mm film, we'd need 2,145 feet of film, and at 15 frames per second, we'd need exactly the same amount. In fact, even if we shot it at 30 frames per second, and slowed it down to one third normal speed, as Collins proposed, we'd still only require 2,145 feet of 16mm film. The largest 16mm film magazine that I am aware of is 2,300 feet, and is only 15 inches in diameter. Perfect! Now we can shoot the whole thing in one mag. No need for a film magazine the size of a Volkswagen. But wait, what's that I hear you say? Hold on a tick, didn't you tell us earlier that the Apollo 11 EVA was probably played at 24 frames per second rather than 10 frames per second? If so, you'd need 2.4 times as much or 5,148 feet of film. Now that won't fit on any available film magazine. That's true, but somewhat irrelevant. We already established that high-speed videos were available in the late 1960s, and hence any argument about being unable to use film is superfluous. But if there was a worthwhile point to this exercise, it would be in showing that shooting at higher frame rates wouldn't alter the required amount of videotape either. And since Collins agrees that we did have the ability to record 143 minutes of continuous video, or at least to make multiple segments of video appear continuous, he must also agree that we had the necessary tape to shoot at higher speeds. In any case, regardless of whether the telecasts were shot on film or videotape, people who agree with Collins's video now have a no-win proposition to face. They can either admit that NASA's official 10 frame per second claim is wrong, or they can try to explain how NASA was clearly able to get 14 additional frames per second out of a 10 frame per second video. I'm quite curious as to what explanation they could possibly have for this. I suspect they'll just blame it on something to do with the slow scan to fast scan conversion or something. But even if by some stroke of luck they do come up with a plausible explanation for this, it would ultimately discredit another key part of Collins's video. Collins claims that the videos from Apollos 12 to 17 would be much harder to fake because they were played back at 30 frames per second, not 10. But, if converting a 10 frame per second video to 30 frames per second can somehow create what clearly appears to be a 24 frame per second video, this argument is moot. Because using that logic, NASA could just play back those videos at 10 frames per second, do their miracle conversions, and then claim it was shot at 30 frames per second all along. You don't want to see the splice marks where you put the reels together, because then everybody would know it was a fake. Oh, you mean like this? Uh, it, we got about, uh, oh, quite a ways to go before we uh, fill up our screen, screen uh, Tom. Uh, it's, uh, there you go, Tom. That's good. All right, and now we've got the... The North Pole on the right. I was just going to say, uh, you know, I think they can broadcast that stuff out uh, uh, in black and white live, but for the color, it has to come over here, be converted, and then transmitted back uh, in a color for the people over in that area, but uh, probably seeing it in black and white. Now, of course, I hear you say, oh, but those are the Apollo 10 in flight telecasts. We're talking about the Apollo 11 moonwalk. Who cares? Because, as I demonstrated previously, the Apollo 11 EVA could all be shot in one 16mm magazine. 
you wouldn't need to worry about sticking films together. If you want to talk about finding evidence of Apollo footage being cut and spliced, I gave you the perfect place to start looking. And remember, we're shooting for TV, so it's 133 aspect ratio, not 185. So, that means you have to do A and B rolls. You have to cut the negative into A and B rolls and print them onto a 5300 foot fine grained interpositive, then cut an answer print in the film lab. And when you're done, make sure everybody that works in the film lab dies mysteriously in a car crash. Actually, we'd only need to make such cuts if we were shooting this on 35mm film. If shot on 16mm film, we would need not worry about it. Because 16mm film also uses 1.33 ratio. Collins claims he is trying to make faking the lunar telecasts easy. Yet the film format he recommends using is one used for cinema, not television. Anyone who has spent 30 years in a studio should know that. Now you just need to find a custom designed telecine that can transfer your 5300 foot answer print to video at 10 frames per second. Pin registered, of course. How hard can that be? This is a fallacy of necessity, because as we previously established, that entire moonwalk could be shot on a single 2300 foot roll of 16mm film. Any conventional telescene could handle that easily. After all, 16mm film was commonly used by television broadcasters. Of course you need to be absolutely certain that in all that splicing and printing and transferring, uh, none of the most common film artifacts have gotten onto your giant print. No base scratches, no emulsion flakes, no gate weave, no grain, and not one single fleck of dust. Because any one of those things will instantly betray that this is a hoax. Why would NASA worry about people finding these artifacts in the footage when what the world saw was a copy of a copy? NASA says that the technicians at their manned spaceflight network transferred the original 10 frame per second footage onto 1 inch tape, which ran at 60 frames per second. But the footage broadcast to the world was in fact shot by a 30 frame per second camera pointed at a television screen. This obviously allowed many, many more grainy artifacts to get in, along with a major reduction of the resolution, contrast and brightness. And this was done on all six supposed missions, including the later ones with better quality colour videos. The unfiltered one inch tapes were stored in 2614 boxes, each containing five reels of tape. When you do the math, we find this accounts for 13,070 rolls of tape. 700 of these tapes were for Apollo 11. All these boxes were stored at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Okay, so why can't we see them? Well, turns out that sometime between 1984 and 2006, they all went missing. And in 2009, it was established that the bulk of Apollo 11 reels had been accidentally taped over. Only two of the 700 original Apollo 11 tapes have been found. The remaining reels from Apollos 12 to 17 apparently still exist, but no one knows where. And even if they could locate them before they disintegrate to dust, it would be to no avail. Because the only known equipment capable of decoding them became unavailable when the facility at the Goddard Center closed in 2006. A few photos, and even home videos of the monitors taken by the Misfin technicians have survived and been published. But although much better quality than the archives, they too have their share of distortion and artifacts. And Collins is worried about people discovering film artifacts in these television transmissions? Please. You think maybe it would be easier to just go to the moon? Nope. So in summary, Collins' so-called evidence that the Apollo videos could not have been faked can be quickly overthrown with a simple Google search and a basic understanding of how these videos were broadcast to the world. That being said, I find it pathetic seeing so many members of the pro NASA side praise and fall blindly behind it as though it were a beacon from God. These individuals would have you believe that it is easier to go to the moon, somehow survive the radiation, and then accidentally lose over 13,000 rolls of tape than it would be to just fake it and get rid of the evidence. Hopefully, now that I have put out this critique to Collins' video, and dealt with yet another boatload of propagandist creativity, I won't need to say anything further about it.